Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. I'm really glad you're here today. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Jen and I talk about, even though we're talking about how to work with kids and having power struggles and having power with as opposed to power over, I think that this is useful information for pretty much any relationship. After Jen and I stopped recording, we realized that we may have used some gendered language and making assumptions around parenting and that it's mothering. And I want to apologize. We're really trying to be mindful about honoring people that are transgender, non-binary, that families don't always come in mothers and fathers. I think we do talk about partners, but if there's anything that we said that felt like it was discounting or negating, it was certainly not our intention. And both of us deeply apologize. What we talk about in this episode are some of the struggles that we both had around parenting and how it's hard. Jen talks about gentle parenting, conscious parenting, collaborative problem solving. We both talk about, you know, it's hard that we want to show up as this loving, nurturing parent. And sometimes we have parts that are not very pretty. I share something that I did with my child that I was very embarrassed about. I worked at Child Protective Services at the time. That means my laundry is ready. And I share in this episode that I called a colleague and said, like, do I have to call in a report on myself? We just talk about how difficult it is, but we talk about how do you, as a highly sensitive parent, manage when you have kids that have a lot of needs, they want to be with you, and you just need some space. We talk about self-care and the components to self-care that really show that you matter and why you want to take care of yourself and model this for your children. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. And now... On to the show. Hey, Jen, welcome. Hi, Patricia. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah. I think I'm doing okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you when we're done. My taskmaster's up. I did talk about in one episode how I appreciate how you show up so authentically and usually my little taskmaster's on and you're so good about acknowledging me and saying thank you. And if we're doing a listener question and I'm just like, just get the job done. And I feel like I lose the humanity of it and you do a great job of making up for that. So I appreciate that about you. I appreciate your taskmaster. It is definitely <laughs> welcome in my world. I need, I need someone to keep me on the rails. She is good at getting stuff done, but no empathy at all. No (laughs) empathy, no social skills. We just get stuff done. I would love to talk to you today about, I have a couple of clients that are HSPs and have young kids that are HSPs. And what I hear from my clients, I'm not saying all of them, but just this pressure that when they've got young kids that really need them, want to touch them, want to be close to them, want to lick them. (laughs) Oh my goodness. My kids did that. Did they? The getting in bed with them in the middle of the night and, you know, either that causing a problem with the spouse because the spouse feels like they just want to have a night of rest with the parent. And then this incredible sense of guilt and overwhelm and feeling like not enoughness of the parent. And so I'm talking about a couple of people. So if, especially if you're the parent of the liquor, uh, I know that you did not talk about being overwhelmed. (laughs) So I just want to be very clear about that. But you know, how do parents manage? And then this incredible sense of guilt. And I'll, I'll tell you that I really regret not being more present for my kids. And when I hear you talk about loving and enjoying your kids, like I was a good enough parent, but it was so hard and I was so afraid of making a mistake. And I can see how with the puppy that we went through this thing where she doesn't like getting her harness on and she really resists it. And the challenge of putting the leash on her collar is that, you know, her trachea is still soft. So if she pulls, I could damage her trachea. But if she won't get the harness on, then I can't take her for a walk. And I've had a couple of times when I found myself getting really mad, like really in you know, like a power struggle with her. And then maybe I'll talk about some other time, kind of the game that we play now 
all about her harness, but sometimes they get really activated. And then I, I have this awareness of this is the same thing that happened with my kids where I get into a power struggle and I stop enjoying her because I just, you know, my taskmaster, you, you have to have a walk, you have to have the harness on and feeling incredibly guilty. It was a great source of connection with my clients, with the kids, because I thought, oh, <laughs> I get what you're talking about. I remember now. <laughs> But I'd love to hear your thoughts and for us to talk about, you know, as a parent, it's so hard, that pressure of not screwing your kids up and then we don't get our needs met. And yeah, what do you have to say, Jen? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I remember those days. First and foremost, I just want to say like those days, those early, well, not, not, I actually had a really good time with like baby, baby infant stage. I did too, because I couldn't talk back then. Right. I was, exactly. I, was, I was in control and I felt like the great nurturing. That's part of it. Like, I feel like the great nurturing mom. And then when my needs come into play and then this like ee- part comes up, does not make me feel real good about myself. Oh my gosh. No, that mom guilt. Yeah. I got a lot to say about this actually. But first I just want to start with, because uh, I remember walking into a mom's group that I was a part of and not not being overly negative, but just being able to say, whew, this stuff's hard, you know, because as mothers, we've, again, got a lot of perfectionism and a lot of these images that we're just supposed to be enjoying it all. And that time period we're talking about, those early childhood, I mean, there's a reason why they're so cute. It keeps us from like pitching them out <laughs> the window. <laughs> I used to say, I know why mother eat why mothers eat their young, you oh, know. Gosh. <laughs> it's like it was hard. I would not wish those days on like my worst enemy. I really wouldn't. It, and it, some of even the infant days with all the sleeplessness and uh, all like the hormonal shifts and stuff like that. And then it's funny. So from this vantage point, right, my kids are nine and 12. Even if <laughs> to me and my, my best friend, Julia, she says, you know, let's dial, I would, I would want to like dial them back to certain ages to just visit with them for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. But I would not stay there, <laughs> right? It would be like, just do it for a little while. There's a lot of beauty in there. And I guess that's what we romanticize. Mm-hmm. But just to acknowledge like while you're in it, it's allowed to suck. And I think that that's something that we don't give parents enough support around. Yeah. And that I think is what gives birth to a lot of, <laughs> gives birth, haha, see that? Um, to the uh, guilt. And the shame. I think there's shame too. Yeah. Yeah. I remember feeling that so intensely. I had this idealized version of myself and what I thought I was going to be as a mother. And, you know, I went through grad school. I did some early childhood education. I thought I knew. (laughs) I waited. I I worked with a lot of teens most of my career, especially early on. Yeah, I thought I I knew. I thought I had studied a lot of child development. Parenting was so, so freaking humbling when it came to it. And I had waited. I think I had my babies. I was 36 for the first one and 39 for the second. Mm -hmm. And so here I thought, you know, I I had my SHIT together, like, and that I was going to really do this and I was going to do it well. And that came really crashing down. And it was so painful. I had this she was almost like a specter of myself and my expectations of myself. I had to externalize her a little bit so I could visualize her and kind of be able to talk with her, kind of like the parts work, right? So this idealized version of the mother I thought I was going to be would come in and start talking to me with all the shame and all the guilt. And, you know, not only wasn't I doing a good job, but like, and then everything that was difficult about that developmental stage that my kid was in, which is all really normal. Like you, you can't, it's like, you can't therapy your way out of being human. You know, <laughs> like you can't parent your kid in such a way that they're not going to have whatever it is, their big feelings or wanting to lick you or, you know, any, they do all sorts of crazy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Nobody tells us this. So anyway, she would come in and just really beat me up. And then through that lens, anything that was difficult was my fault. And it was horrific. 
Oh, so, you know, the, with the parts work, we embrace those parts of ourselves and see them as trying to protect us and see them as really having uh, some core beliefs that perhaps we need to unburden ourselves of. Yeah. And I think it's hard that if you're in a place where, hmm, I don't want to sound like I'm afraid that this is going to sound harsh. I have a specific client in mind. When you just feel like you should be doing a better job and you're so identified with that and you just feel so bad for not being able to do it differently. That just is such a hard place to be in. I'm thinking about, I, I don't know if I've told this story, that one of my kids was just so challenging and so defiant and until I learned a different way to parent him, but I came at him with power and that did not work. And I remember restraining him at a timeout and he bit me and I reflexively bit him back. Like I was just so, it, it wasn't like I'm going to bite you and show you. It's just like, gosh darn it, er- And I worked for Child Protective Services at the time, and I remember calling a friend and going, like, if I leave a mark, do I have to report myself? I mean, I was appalled that I did it, and it happened so quickly, and just the frustration of, you know, I felt like I just could not get this child to comply, and that that form of parenting was not effective. But he'd get activated, and I'd get activated, and... (sighs) Yeah. And that, I think, is a real paradigm shift that we're doing as parents, hopefully, where we're moving away from this power over dynamic Mm -hmm. and the expectation that we could have power over to um, power with, Mm -hmm. uh, which has its own challenges, right? So nothing's going to be like a magic bullet. When you do a lot of that, the gentle parenting, the conscious parenting, and this happened with my daughter, when you do a lot of power with, it can flip kids into like this alpha kind of space. Uh, where they really think that they're in charge. And we don't want to give up our parenting ideals, right, by going back to a power over dynamic, but there is a way to counterbalance that. And it's really uh, making sure that we accentuate that we're the caregiver, right, that we are the ones in charge. We're the font of all everything good <laughs> uh, for the kids. And and I do get into that with my parenting work and the parenting course because, again, it's not like there's one magic bullet, right? Uh, every parenting approach, just like everything else in life, right? Comes with these like pros and cons. It gets, what does it get you? <laughs> mm-hmm. And then how do we mitigate some of the cons? But just to speak, I mean, thank you so much for sharing that. I can certainly share some low parenting moments as well. I think we all can if we're willing to be open mm-hmm. and vulnerable. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it is a lot of it can be really reflexive. And that that's kind of scary, I think, because we all have that part of us that's out of control, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or that takes control. And, and it's like that that wild animal we live with, yeah, that more primitive part of us. And the part of us that wants to present as the good, loving, nurturing parent. So when that part comes up, there can be so much shame around, oh, my gosh, I can't believe what I did and how terrible. So, yeah. The parts work is really helpful with this mm-hmm. because then we can kind of understand ourselves as kind of operating on these different levels of consciousness, really. Right. <laughs> right? Instead of if we think we're mono-minded, there's only one of us in there, then which one is the real one or which one mm-hmm. gets to win, you know, and which is not harmonizing your system. Right. Maybe moving into some like pragmatic stuff for HSP parents, right? I would love that. So yeah. it's funny, whenever I, I say this to parents, I preface it by, okay, don't throw anything at me because <laughs> your number one parenting tool, right, is going to be self-care. And of course, parents are so short on time and energy. Mm-hmm. And so self-care has to take on kind of a new meaning. <laughs> mm-hmm. It has to be the type of self-care that like you matter, right? That you matter in this equation. And I think that parents for wanting to be all that and a bag of chips for their kids, right? Wanting this to be this perfect parent. uh, That's where we get into like that martyr kind of, I'm going to give you everything. And at least that, (laughs) I can always say that, right? And that, that doesn't help anybody. That doesn't teach our kids to take really good care of themselves, But um, so self-care, I include a couple of dimensions of self-care, right? Like just what do you, what do you need to do for yourself, right? Whether that's some breath, some, some exercise, connecting with a friend, all the things you don't feel like you have time for, but putting yourself in the universe, right? Like putting yourself as central and I call it, it's not selfish. I call it self-centering 
because the energy that you bring to your kids matters and you have to be taking care of yourself on some level, even if it's simultaneous, like taking care of yourself with your child there too, like, you know, taking out to those walks, right, in the stroller. And then there's the, you know, how are we doing those things on that list, right? What's the attitude with which we do it in and how do we support ourselves around doing it? So do you just kind of, you know, hold all that tension in your body and fold the laundry as quickly as you can? Or, you know, can you put on a favorite song and try to enjoy it? Not that I don't want to give anyone the impression that I fold laundry. It happens very seldomly. We kind of live out of uh, (laughs) laundry baskets, but (laughs) your life isn't at the end of your to-do list, right? (laughs) To-do list is a component of your life. So in what ways can you not treat yourself like a robot, right? Like treat yourself like a human being. So I'm talking music, I'm talking flowers, buying them for the table, like just things that show that you're a human being, that you matter, that you matter to yourself. And then the third component to self-care is really that inner self-talk. Like, is it a safe space in there? Mm -hmm. And that's the parts work. And I know I did need help. I mean, the best therapists have therapists. I use therapists. I use a parenting coach. It's just amazing because as much as I've studied this and spent my life, you know, doing this work, I can't do it for myself. I need that interaction with someone to help me reflect and think about myself and what I'm doing. That and I guess earplugs. Earplugs were my next favorite (laughs) (laughs) parenting tool. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And very much like you, I was 36 years old when I had the twins. My master's degree was in children, youth, and family. And I felt like I've got this nailed. I waited. I'd been in therapy. And I'll tell you, having two kids that both have ADHD and had mood disorders, it was hard. And I I felt less supported by moms of twins because they were not having the struggles that I did. I felt like I got more support and nurturing from my parents, you know, my friends that had just singletons because I just felt like, how come I don't have control over my kids? And one of the books that was really helpful called The Explosive Child by Ross Green, he talks about collaborative problem solving. And I actually came to it intuitively where I stopped having the power struggles and often with the child that I'm talking about, you know, we would kind of figure out what would work for you and then we'd negotiate. And I felt like I was capitulating. And then when I did his training, I went back east and trained with him for a couple of days and to find out that this was this was a real thing and it wasn't me just giving in because that's it's like I felt like I was giving in and it worked. But then to get validated that it really was a legitimate way of parenting and it really helped so much with the power struggles. And, you know, I can tell you that at age, my kids will be 22 next month, this child that I'm talking about is in Amsterdam and he's calling us and telling us about what he's experiencing and you know the relationship that we have is so close and I feel like because we did make that shift where we really were more child-centered and less authoritative and really joined with them you know you worry about kids being in bed and I can tell you that you know my kids were in bed with me through middle school and like they come home now from college and I I guarantee you they don't want to sleep with us you know like (laughs) it's okay they you know at some point they do want to get back in their own beds and it's okay yeah, I still definitely have the more occasional now, but <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, well, bed sharer. I also did that. Co-slept, had, and mm-hmm. yeah, my kids never had cribs. So I mean, you bring up a good point because I do think because we think in these like binaries, we think that peaceful parenting is permissive parenting mm-hmm. and it really isn't. Mm-hmm. You know, or or passive parenting, like, and, and it's it's just not. Um, it's really working out that power, power with. It's respecting the child. I was with Gabor Mate and Dick Schwartz were doing that seminar. I think I spoke about. Mm-hmm. And Gabor Mate had such a beautiful way of putting it that you know, until we can really say no, our yes means nothing. Mm-hmm. And that nature gives small children. I'm talking two, three years old. This very powerful no. And it's meant to be, I think he put it like, it's like a little fence around a sapling and that it's a really important part of human development. And I think as parents, we get scared that it means something about us when our child isn't behaving, which could not be Mm -hmm. further from the truth. I mean, these are Their brains are not fully developed until they're 25 years old. These are Mm -hmm. not even (laughs) half-baked little cavemen monsters. Mm -hmm. And But the pressure that we put on ourselves, it was funny. 
I was at my parents' 50th wedding anniversary a couple weeks ago, and I had an older relative, right? He observed an interaction between me and my daughter. And I can tell you how it went. I had given her the keys to the car so that she could go and get something. And then we were trying to clean up and get get going. And I asked her, uh, okay, where are my keys? And she had forgotten in the interim. And she's like, how would I know where your keys are? Are they your keys? And I said, well, I did give them to you so you can go in the car, remember? And it was a very light exchange because I have that relationship with my daughter. It's not, it's a relational way of parenting as opposed to like a transactional or a, you know, this power dynamic way of parenting. And um, she, she laughed and, and said, oh yeah, you know, I, I put him back in your bag and, and it was fine. But this older relative was like, oh, I like how your daughter was talking to you. And a few years ago, that would have probably made me crazy. And this time I was just able to look at him and be like, yeah, we do things a little differently than they did back in your in your generation or how you were doing it and really felt at peace with it. And the hard part about that is I, I mm-hmm. couldn't have had that peace when my kids were one or three or, you know, even up until, honestly, just recently, knowing that this works. And I think having the support of others, yeah. knowing other peaceful parents, having that community is so important. I think for many of us, and I could be wrong, so I'm curious to know what your thoughts. When my kids got to the age where I could use more verbal skills and more explaining, things got easier. But it's those kind of young, impulsive parts of that how kids are supposed to be that were just so hard to manage because it's like having a puppy. The puppy just, you know, like I left something out, the puppy chewed on it. The puppy's eating my wired earbuds. The puppy chewed through an electric blanket. And every time it happens, like... I should know better. I left a pen out. The puppy got the pen. Like, I should know better. The puppy's just being a puppy, you know? Any The world is, puppy gets it mm-hmm. through its mouth. And it's the same thing mm-hmm. with kids. And so I think also just to know that those, you know, first handful of years, and then if you have multiple kids and you're dealing with all those needs, it's just hard. And can it be okay that it's hard? Yes, can, exactly. And can we let our, our kids go through what, for some reason, they're meant to go through? And this is where I kind of lean into just trusting Mother Nature, um, but I, I feel you, like those those years that are so unreasonable, I just remember, I didn't know whether I wanted to scream or like, and it's funny because I call it a parallel process between what the parents going through and actually what the kids going mm-hmm. through too. Yeah, it's it's so fun really. But, you know, my kids would want to do crazy stuff. Like they want their shoes on and off at the same time, or they want to be up the stairs and down the stairs at the exact same time. You know, the, the <laughs> my son was overjoyed to have a cookie bit into it and then flipped out that the cookie wasn't whole anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just crazy making. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to circle back to something that you said about self-care. I think especially, so So what I'm going to say is very gendered and I don't know how to say it in a non-gendered way. So please forgive me for those of you that don't fit the gender binary. So I, I don't know how to say it. As women, we are taught to self-sacrifice and to martyr, to give to our partners and to our children. And what we end up doing is we model to our children how to not have a sense of self. And when we think that we're going to be selfish by saying no or taking care of ourselves or saying that we can't do it or taking time alone, we are modeling self-care, which is what we want, especially if you've got highly sensitive kids. You want to model how you care for yourself and what you do. So to really flip that paradigm of thinking that you're being selfish and you're being a bad parent to you are teaching your kids how you take care of yourself and how your kids can learn to say no and take care of themselves. I think that's crucial. Absolutely. And we know that modeling is really the way human beings learn. Right. Yeah. We want it to be empowering. All right, Jen, you have a minute to wrap it up meaningfully. No pressure. Go. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's so much more to say. So I do look forward to maybe some more conversations around parenting. But thank you for this uh, start today. I hope some of what we said was helpful to somebody out there. I think just knowing it's hard. It's okay that it's hard. It's going to bring up your own stuff. My kid would slam doors. I'd slam doors because I wasn't allowed to. And then I'd apologize and we'd work through it. You know, your kids may be bringing up stuff that you weren't allowed to do, and you either allow your kids to do it, and then it gets out of control, which is what I did with my kids. My kids could negotiate their way out of a box because I wasn't allowed to. You know, we just do the best we can. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here today, Jen. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. (laughs) 
Hey again. I'm curious to know how that landed with you. I know that when you're struggling, when I'm struggling, it can often be hard to hear information and not use that information to beat myself up with and to feel inadequate. My hope is that Jen and I really validated that parenting is hard, especially having young kids. It's just hard. I mean, all stages have a different kind of hard. If you are struggling and you need support, please reach out and get it, whether it's from Jen or from me or from someone else. You really deserve to feel nurtured and supported, to know that it's okay to take care of yourself, to get some help around some of these things around parenting that are just really challenging. If you are struggling in your relationships, if you're struggling with boundaries, perfectionism, taking care of yourself, speaking up, asserting yourself, not liking conflict, those are often things that people that are deep thinkers and deep feelers have struggles with, and it's okay. Jen and I are both here to support you. You can reach out to me at unapologeticallysensitive.com or Jen at Jen at heartfulnessconsulting.com. We both want to see you survive and thrive as a deep thinker and deep feeler. My hope is that you're doing well, and if you're struggling, that's okay as long as it's not too much struggling. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. Thank you.